Hi everyone and welcome to the recording of our final Tuesday talk about ecology and wildlife as part of the autumn programme for redesigning Grosvenor Square. I'm Natalie from Make Good and we've been working alongside Grosvenor to make sure people have the best opportunities to get involved in the project and influence new designs. When we set out to redesign Grosvenor Square, we knew we wanted to do this with our neighbours and with other London communities, bringing together the best knowledge to create a new type of urban square which encourages discovery and fosters well-being. Our aim was always to create a shared vision between Grosvenor, our local and London communities and the design team. We've used the feedback from our summer exhibition where we tested initial designs to shape the developing design ideas that we're sharing and testing with you in this exhibition and through a programme of events this autumn. The exhibition in the square is now finished, but you can still see all of the information online at grosvenorsquare.org. Of the key sets of information that we're sharing and testing about the developing designs, a theme that runs through them all is ecology and wildlife. You told us you wanted us to provide more natural planting with a variety of trees, seasonal change, that, and that could invite and support wildlife. You also told us you wanted there to be a potential for water to see, hear and touch. As part of the autumn exhibition, we explored the hidden water garden further with a model and tested planting variety and species by creating a temporary planting installation. This will be up in Grosvenor Square until the middle of November. I will now hand over to Georgie Nibs from the Ecology Consultancy. Georgie is part of the design team and is responsible for ensuring the square is a thriving place for wildlife. Georgie delivered an inspiring walk and talk for us in the square on the 20th of October. This is an abridged version of the talk and unfortunately due to social distancing measures and safety guidelines, we were unable to record the questions and answer sections of the event from the audience. If you have any questions or comments after listening to this talk, please send them via our website, grosvenorsquare.org. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, hopefully you can hear me all right. It is a bit noisy here today. Um, there's lots of... Everywhere, yeah, construction. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of lawn mowing going on as well. Um, so yeah, my name is Georgie Nibs. I work for the Ecology Consultancy. Um, we are a company based in Bermondsey, so normally I work in a Bermondsey office, um, but at the moment, of course, I'm working from home. Um, I've worked at the Ecology Consultancy for, I think, coming up to six years. I've been a consultant ecologist for about eight and a half, um, and so six years working in London. That means that I've become quite specialised in urban ecology. Um, I'm also personally really interested in plants. Um, I also hold a Great Great Sydney license and a Dormouse license. Um, and at the Ecology Consultancy, we work on a quite a large range of different projects. Mostly, um, it's working with developers um, who have maybe residential developments, um, also quite large infrastructure projects. Um, we do strategic kind of urban design um, projects um, looking at um, sort of public realm and open space um, and I also work on um, reviews of sites of importance for nature conservation um, so occasionally we get to work on projects like this where we're literally just focusing on making spaces better for people and wildlife and that's that's the ecology consultancy's tagline that's what we're aiming to do and of course that's what we're going to be doing here at Grosvenor Square um, We've been brought in on this project for that purpose. Um, we have been asked by Grosvenor Estate to do um, a biodiversity audit, essentially, of the square. Um, so over the summer, we've completed a range of different ecology surveys. We've started by doing a habitat survey, um, and then we've completed um, a suite of bird surveys, some bat surveys, and um, an invertebrate survey as well. So yeah, I'll be sharing with you some of those results um, so that you can un start to understand um, what's already here, um, whether there's anything of interest that um, is worth protecting and retaining. Um, and um, as Natalie said at the end, I'll probably then talk about some of the proposals and how those will enhance the square for ecology in general um, and bring a much more diverse range of wildlife into the square. Um, so I want to start off by 
talking about where we are in the landscape. Obviously, we're situated in London, so urban metropolis, um, and you probably all know it very well. I'm sure you're mostly local people. Um, but if we start to think about how the square fits into the landscape, um, so near here, there's plenty of other um, open spaces and squares. Um, we've got obviously Hyde Park, it's only about 350 metres down there. Um, there's Portman Square, you've got Hanover Square that way. Um, there's Barclay Square that way. And if you keep going then south, you've of course got um, St James's and Kensington Gardens down that way. Um, and those spaces all together create a network of stepping stones, we call them, that are of value to wildlife. So you can start to think of how those spaces then all connect together um, via the street trees and um, potentially green infrastructure features as well. Um, and you can start to see then how wildlife actually moves around this part of London. Um, Grosvenor Estate obviously own quite a lot of the, the land and the property near here. Um, and alongside, I think, five other uh, landed estates, um, they've partnered together to um, deliver this initiative called the Wild West End. And the idea with the Wild West End is to create even more of these um, green infrastructure pockets. Um, so creating um, retrofit designs of green roofs, um, creating little pocket parks, um, putting, you might have seen them sort of planted planters along the, the roads um, and outside shops and things, just to sort of, again, bolster those connections between the open spaces and allow nature to move through the landscape a bit better. Um, so as well as providing more spaces and connections for wildlife to move around, those green infrastructure features obviously will deliver quite a lot of ecosystem service benefits. Um, so they'll um, do things like um, new trees will, um, will capture carbon from the atmosphere um, and hold that and store that for a long time. Um, they are also, trees are amazing because of course, I mean, you'll probably have heard this last week, um, they, they even do things like um, obviously slow down the water so rain, if, or these sort of flash flood events that we're getting more frequently, they slow down, um, slow down the water that's moving through the landscape. Um, they provide so much shade and really all these green infrastructure features will um, create much more sort of cooler environments in the summer um, for us. So by investing in this Wild West End initiative, um, Grosvenor Estate are looking to provide um, an environment that's both better for wildlife and, and us as people. Um, obviously now we want to focus in on Grosvenor Square itself, so um, I want to sort of bring the focus back here. Um, as most of you are probably quite local, um, I was wondering whether we might ask a question to you guys about um, what sort of what wildlife you've seen here before? In the square? In the square and in the local area. Foxes. You see foxes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, birds. and birds, yeah. They're so noisy, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, parakeets have... I mean, that's something I've noticed over the past six years working in London. When I first moved here, um, I really only noticed them in some of the larger parks, but over time they've just really become abundant everywhere. Wow. That is really lucky that, yeah, it's quite sad. The hedgehog's population is really going down. Um, yeah. Um, it's really difficult in squares like this because um, because we've got the barriers of the roads. Um, so it's really hard for them to colonise um, areas. Also, hedgehogs have a surprising range, like home range. They need something like 20, 30 gardens per hedgehog. So when you start to think about how uh, most residential gardens now have fences on, 
um, if they get trapped inside one one garden, that's just not going to cut it. So, yeah, we do a lot of recommendations now when we're um, working on residential screens to encourage developers and homeowners to create gaps under their fences, just purely just to help the hedgehogs. Yeah. Um, so that's amazing that you managed to see them. Yeah. So, um, as an ecologist, I like to think about how the habitats are all connected and all of the ecosystem is really a system and everything is, is connected and everything impacts one another. And one of the ways that we can sort of understand those links, one of the sort of basic principles is by food webs. So, of course, you're probably familiar with food webs where we think about the plants being the real baseline um, they provide food and um, food for all of the different organisms higher up the food chain. Um, so they'll be supporting um, the invertebrates, which then will be um, prey resource for small birds and mammals like bats. And eventually those might be fed on by birds of prey and larger, um, larger predators. Um, so as we're walking around, I wanted to sort of start by thinking about the plants and right at the bottom. Um, and when we look around in the square, probably, I mean, above ground, probably the most uh, numerous organism in the square is the grass. Um, and when we look at it, it does look quite uniform. And that's because it's dominated by a single species of grass. Um, so, um, as you can imagine, it's all quite low and uniform, doesn't have that much value for wildlife. But when you start to look a bit closer, you will spot a few different things within the lawn as well as the grass. Um, you want to follow me a bit further along, see if you can spot anything as you're walking. There's something here, some dandelion. Um, some daisy, that's a patch of daisy that hasn't flowered. This is all daisy. It's on there. Some more dandelions. There's a plant called plantain um, that's fairly frequent in the, the grass as well. Uh, we've got some chickweed here. This is a um, ragwort. We heard of ragwort. And right here um, we have um, this is Yarrow, um, and its Latin name is Achillea millifolium. Um, so I wanted to talk about this because um, the story about how it got its Latin name is quite interesting, I think. Um, the story goes that um, the Greek mythological warrior Achilles um, used to use this plant um, to create medicinal ointments for his soldiers. And that's where the first part of the Latin name comes from, Achillea. Um, and in fact, this is edible, um, if you're into foraging, but I wouldn't recommend eating this one. The populations of dogs here is quite, quite strong. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, and the second part of its Latin name, the species, um, is millifolium. That translates to just many, many leaves. Um, when you, if you look up a bit closer, there's a big patch here. You'll see that the um, the leaf is kind of feather-like, and that's because it's got many, many leaflets on it. So there, uh, it's the Chilea medifolium. No, it's this one. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit sort of feathery. That one there is chickweed. Yeah. But all of these things, if they're left to grow a little bit longer, they all they all have flowers on. Um, so them in themselves provide a lot of value for pollinating invertebrates. Um, they also provide a few other sort of functions. So um, I'm sure that there's some white clover in this lawn. Um, clover has this property that allows it to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere in the soil therefore allowing the um, other plants to sort of benefit as well. Clover, yeah. I actually haven't seen it near here. 
But, it, you know, four-leaf clovers, you know how people try and find a four-leaf clover for good luck? So normally they've got three leaves on them. I'll show, I'll point one out if I see them later. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the lawn is fairly fairly undiverse, I suppose, um, but it does have some minor value, especially when it's allowed to grow up a bit longer. Um, probably one of the more valuable habitats in the square um, are the trees. Um, I think, I know that there was a tree talk last week, so I don't want to go into this too much detail, but um, the square has about 70 odd trees in it, which is quite a lot. Um, but the majority, about 50 of them, um, are London plain. So again, it's dominated by one species. Um, so this is a London plain tree here. Um, these are the leaves. Now, I like to, um, I, I teach plant identification um, as part of my job to my colleagues. And um, I always like trying to teach people how to identify London plain trees because um, there's many different ways in which you can spot them. Um, but it's one of the it's one of the plants that actually caught me out during an interview. So for my last for this job actually, um, when I went to interview we had a plant test um, to prove that I could do plant identification. Um, and one of these leaves was on in my test. Um, and what I thought, and what you could probably see in this, is that it looks quite a lot like a, a maple leaf. Um, it looks quite a lot like a sycamore. Um, it also looks like many of the other Acer species. Um, so even like a Japanese Japanese maple or um, field maple. Um, so trying to identify London Plain by its leaf is not a good idea. Really what you want to think about are the features that make it unique. And if you look at the tree behind us, I think one of the things that stands out the most is its bark. And you can see how it, what happens is it creates this kind of these plates of bark on, on the surface, which all sort of age um, and change color over time. So you end up with a really sort of quite colorful um, bark. So you can see where where plates of, of bark have fallen off, that's where it's fresh and different colour underneath. Um, so, and that you can see all year round as well, so even when there's no tree, no leaves to look at. The other thing I really like about London Plain is um, its seed balls. So if you, look at, if you look up into the canopy, you can start to spot um, its seed heads, which are almost like baubles, I think. They almost like they've got sort of Christmas decorations on them. Um, I think London plain trees have been planted so frequently in London because they're quite good for air quality. I think that's why they're so common here. Yeah, um, so there's a few other tree species here. I think you probably would have heard last week because you've got like walnut trees here. Um, there's some cherries, some oaks, some lime trees. Um, and then one of the other features that I wanted to sort of just point out is the hedge that runs around the outside of the site. Um, that's completely, again, dominated by one species, it's holly. Um, I don't know, oh yeah, I've got one fact about holly. So, um, obviously holly is um, something that we all think about Christmas time, and the sort of um, symbol of Christmas being the holly with the holly berries, the red berries. Um, but the interesting thing is that only the female holly bushes um, actually have berries on them so it's one of those it's, it's one of it's one of those species that um, where it's female and male flowers um, and repro reproductive organs are completely separate on different plants individual plants um, so I don't know if do any of you ever see the holly bushes here with berries on you think you do over there yeah Right. Yeah, so I wonder whether we might have some female ones. Of course, you do need to have both male and female flowers um, present so that those um, flowers can be pollinated because um, it's only the pollinated flowers that will eventually bear fruit. 
so. Um, the other types, the other habitats that are present, um, apart from the lawn, the trees, the hedges, we've got um, some area of planted, some planted beds, which are actually quite, quite diverse. So I think we'll go there next. Um, and I'll point out a few things there. So I'm here with you now to maybe talk about um, some of the invertebrates that we recorded on the site. Um, we actually recorded a surprising amount um, and we only came to visit to sample for them once. Um, but the majority of them, once they were identified, we realised that they were mainly species that have um, colonised London in the past 50 years or so, um, which is quite interesting in itself actually. Um, if you want to have a look at some of the photos that you've got, you've probably got um, one that looks like a beetle, but with a really long nose. That is a species of weevil. <laughs> yeah, so this is a hollyhock beetle. Um, I'll try and say it's Latin. Oropalapion longoroster. So that was first recorded in London in 2006. Um, so pre prior to that, we didn't know that it was here. It probably wasn't here. Where did it come from? I don't know. <laughs> I should have researched that. Thank you. Um, but fascinating in the fact that, <laughs> just how it looks really. Um, so it's probably only about this, this small. It's really tiny. Um, in the f and it, they... They specifically live on hollyhock. Oh, thank you. Keep it, maybe. Thank you. Um, so this is a hollyhock here. So there's there's a few planted in the beds already. Um, you got the flower at the bottom there. It's just dying off. Um, so they've sort of become adapted to living on on hollyhock. Um, and apparently these can grow so that four-fifths of their body is nose. So this path can be four-fifths of the body size and so <laughs> um, I know that the entomologist that came to site he did a few different sampling techniques. I think he he put um, some something to catch things on the bottom of the on the floor, like a, a cloth or something. And then he'll literally just bash the plants for a little bit and see what falls off and then collect that and identify it back in the lab. Um, he also put, I don't think he put pitfall traps in because you have to leave them for quite some time to collect things. Um, and then he probably used um, an apparatus piece called a pooter, which is essentially um, a sampling pot fitted with two tubes one tube goes on the floor or whatever he wants to pick up and then he he would suck the other tube and that there's there's a there's something to stop it it's just sucking straight up into his mouth um the pooter so i think he probably did that to collect some um p i think it's p o o t e r pooter yeah um so this is one of the other um bugs that he found and this is a london plane tree bug. Um, these are, again, specialised on a particular plant, the sort of red beetle. Have you, do you recognise it? No? It might be because they like living in the canopy of the London plane trees. Yeah, a bit bigger than the weevil. Um, and uh, that was first recorded in London in 2007. So again, quite new, quite a new species. Um, they will probably eat the eat the leaves, but it's not gone to the po the point where it would. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It all sort of contributes to the ecosystem. Um, so one of the prettiest things I think that we were found was this, which is a four-banded flower bee. Um, this is a specialist on feeding on plants in the mint family. Um, and I think it was recorded here on lavender. That's what this photo is. Um, so it'll also feed on things like mint, um, rosemary, um, thyme, marjoram, anything anything that's kind of an aromatic um, herb 
quite likes that. So bees are interesting in the fact that they have, as different species, and they have different lengths of tongue, and that's what that's what um, that's what um, distinguishes what it can feed on. Although some are really clever and actually pierce the bottom of the um, flower just to get the nectar a bit easier. Um, I think someone mentioned that they they had seen some yellow butterflies. There's a photo somewhere of one of them. I can't find it. There. Um, so this is a brimstone butterfly. Um, we didn't record this, but they typically are only seen really early in the spring. It's one of the first species you'll see each brimstone. Brimstone. Yeah. Um, this species, they have been, they've adapted so that they, um, they lay their eggs pretty much exclusively on buckthorn and old buckthorn plants. Um, so to try and attract them into the square, we can do things like plant those species of, of shrub. And that is um, a London biodiversity action plan species. So it's something that would be really nice to encourage in. No, it's not the cabbage white, so they're different. There's two there's two white cabbage white butterflies and they've got really boring names. One's for the large white and one's the small white. The other thing that we did surveys for were, were birds. So we've actually completed three separate um, bird survey visits um, through June and July. Um, and the um, surveyor, th she just quietly sort of sat and, sat and watched the birds that were here. Um, she found 16 different species across her visits. Um, and she thinks that about seven or eight of those species were nesting in the, in the park. Um, so she found quite a lot of the typical typical birds that you might expect. So robins, blackbirds, um, great, kit, great tit, um, blue tit, um, and wrens. Wrens are adorable, they're really tiny. Um, one of the most interesting things that she found was the coal tit. Um, we've got a photo of that in here. So we were fairly surprised to see this because it's not very common in central London. Um, they do look like a chick because they're just so tiny, very sweet. Um, so they have, they specialise on feeding on um, conifer trees. Um, and because there's not actually any conifer trees really here, I don't think at all, um, what's likely is that they are actually living and breeding in Hyde Park. So there's quite a lot of conifers there. Um, and it might be that they're just coming into Grosvenor Square occasionally to, to feed like the parakeets, yeah. Um, so it might be that they're, they're feeding on the holly hedge as an evergreen species. Yeah, um, so that's quite nice. Yeah, so they, um, the, in the, the insects that like the, yeah, that like the conifers, that's right. Yeah. Um, so we can do things like um, planting specific um, plants that are really attractive to these bird species but we could even do things like actually setting up bird feeders and bird boxes so I was just wondering that might be a good question for you guys whether you think that that might be a good idea whether you'd like to see that in the square so you're saying that um, if it's not maintained properly it could cause yeah a bit of a mess and maybe encourage rats in mm -hmm. so we can you, there's lots of different designs of bird boxes out there as well and they've been designed specifically for certain species so you have ones that have the little tiny hole in the classic bird box look they're mainly attractive to things like blue tits and great tits um, but you can get some that have an open front on them um, so kind of like much bigger gap obviously then that would be suitable for bigger bird species <laughs> i mean the interesting other thing thing about um when bird food drops to the ground it actually then is um more likely to be eaten by the by the species of bird that typically feed on the ground. So, um, for example, you won't really ever see blackbirds up on a bird feeder. They will always just hoover up the stuff that's fallen down. Um, and pigeons, <laughs> again. Yeah. Okay, I think maybe we can move on to our last pot. Sorry. 
Okay, I'll just stop here. Try not to disturb the people having their lunch. <laughs> um, so, we've talked about um, the habitat survey that we did, we talked about the invertebrate survey, the bird survey, and um, we've also completed um, a range of bat surveys here. Um, and what we did to begin with was when we, when we first came to the square, we inspected all the trees um, and structures like this for their potential to house roosting bats. Um, so we looked for features like um, cavities in the trees, um, things like loose bark, um, woodpecker holes are fantastic for bats. Um, and then um, from that, we actually discovered that majority of the trees are in really good condition. Um, and they mostly don't have any of these features at all. Um, the only ones that we found were pretty superficial, where old limbs had maybe fallen off, but they had healed pretty well. Um, and I did mention before that the London plane bark does get this kind of kind of crackled effect, but in the most part, you don't end up with um, with cracks or crevices that are big enough for bats behind those. So we actually didn't find any trees with particular bat potential. Um, but what we did notice with this memorial structure was that there's actually lots of cracks and crevices in the in the wood, both in the pillars and also towards the top of the building. Um, so we thought perhaps it could be of value to roosting bats. Um, so what we did then was um, we came back and we did some activity surveys. We came with our bat detectors, which is a the thing um, they what they do is they um, they listen out for the the bat um, echolocation and changes the frequency from I think it's something like 50 kilohertz mostly um, down to um, a frequency that we can hear as humans so that we can actually hear the bats as they're moving around um, and um, what we did is we walked a transect just to um, a predetermined route about around the square and stopped at certain locations a bit like what we're doing today um, and we wrote down what bats we saw and what they were doing and we did we just we did um, at night so what we do is we tend to come out obviously after it gets dark because bats are nocturnal um, and um, yeah and you've seen bats here and here as well yeah so um, we saw two different species. Um, we saw common pipistrelle bats and um, we also recorded some nocturnal bats. When we came back, we actually also put up um, static bat detectors that recorded the bat echolocation over a period of about a week. Um, so every night they automatically turned on and started recording and they recorded the, the bat echolocation all night. Um, we specifically positioned these um, at four different locations around the square so that we could potentially gauge which parts of the square were most valuable to bats. That was the idea. We found that the static bat detector that recorded the most bats was the one along the north boundary of the site. Um, and it was facing, obviously, in towards the site. Um, so the, my theory is that the the area of planting over near the where our last stop was um, is actually quite diverse and had quite a lot of insects feeding on it and therefore um, that was where, where the bats were foraging because they were eating all of the insects so they were congregating there um, they will also avoid the edges of the edges of the sites um, edge of the square and the road because um, basically all bats are affected by artificial light so um, they would congregate in the most sort of shaded areas it's weird to think of shade in the night isn't it but when um, they definitely prefer to be in the tree canopy um, and in sheltered locations so during the day they will sleep so they go into their roosts um, they have different roosts. Each bat will have a different roost to sort of go to at different part, times of the year. 
Um, so when they're during their mating season, they'll congregate with lots of other bats. Um, but most of the males will then um, go and find their own spaces to stay on their own for, the, for most of the rest of the year. <coughs> so in the end, we found that there weren't any bats clearly re roosting here. We put a, a bat detector up actually on this building and left it there. Um, and typically bats emerge at really quite specific times from their roosts each night. And we found that the majority of the bats we recorded were much were coming out much later than that. So it would have been that they were coming from their roosts elsewhere, perhaps in Hyde Park or some of the other squares, and then coming to Grosvenor Square just to feed, have a little forage. Yes, yeah, so they feed on insects. So, um, as I mentioned before, my theory is that where you've got the most diverse area of planting, um, the more sort of nectar and pollen sources there are, the more invertebrates there are, and therefore that's where the bats like to come because they can eat the invertebrates. Yeah, um, there's there's research being done on how noise can affect bats. It's probably more the vibration itself than the the noise because they probably adapted to listen to different sounds than us as their range of hearing will be different but nonetheless a lot of vibration coming from the construction and demolition might might disturb them yeah mm -hmm. um so we've got a recording of a bat to listen to now You can also hear an owl, try and ignore the owl. <laughs> oh, sounds like a woodpecker a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so that is a common pipistrelle. Um, no, that is its um, echolocation call. So it will, what it does is produces um, a high frequency sound wave, basically shouts, but a sound that we can't hear. That's it. Yeah. There's also an owl. That's an owl. <laughs> yeah. And um, this is actually just a video from YouTube. <laughs> so I'm not sure, um, but this is very. This is the species that we've that we call recorded here, um, common pipistrelle. So we've, yeah, I just wanted to quickly mention how well, we've already talked about how light can impact on bats as well. Um, so um, maybe if we think about some of the other reasons why the square doesn't have as much wildlife, um, we've of course got the development projects um, probably causing a bit of disturbance. We've got the unfortunately roads on all four sides of the square which prevents things like hedgehogs maybe moving in um, but the proposals for the square um, will really increase the diversity of the different habitats here will creating the kind of the oval the oval shaded garden for example will mimic thing will mimic a kind of um, woodland habitat and bats are mainly as well, bats love woodland. <laughs> so, uh, right, yes, so are you asking whether I'm concerned about mosquitoes potentially moving into um, the water, the water features here? Yeah, well, I think there are already mosquitoes in the country, um, but they are not um, the species that transmit things like malaria. Um, there are certain other similar, they might bite, yeah, there's, I mean, of course, Scotland even has lots of midges, so um, we do have flying biting invertebrates already. Um, whether it's going to encourage them here, um, I think that mostly with mosquitoes, they tend to lay their eggs in stagnant water um, and in pools that um, aren't disturbed very often. The one that is proposed here will be constantly kind of being refreshed and 
um, its water quality will probably be quite high by the way that it's designed, so I wouldn't be too concerned about mosquitoes, I don't think. Okay, so um, to finish my talk, I wanted to kind of remind us that, especially in an urban like landscape, human beings are part of the ecosystem. Um, and of course, we want to make sure that the square is both of value for wildlife and people and visitors. So um, I wanted to just touch on some of the, the key areas of planting that will be of particular value to wildlife. Um, in particular, the shaded garden, as I mentioned earlier, will be really fantastic. So it will mimic a woodland structure um, that will provide different niches for different, different organisms. We'll have more structural diversity in the underplanting beneath the existing plane trees that are mostly going to be, t I think they're all going to be kept. Um, and um, there'll be a sort of central glade. So um, bats in particular really enjoy that transition between um, the woodland edge and an open space um, as they could sort of navigate the landscape by their echolocation calls they do really value that kind of separation between a tall habitat and open space um, so they will find um, the transition between the, the glade central area and the oval garden really valuable um, also one of the other key um, features that will be really really incredible for biodiversity here um, will be what we do with water and as you probably gathered from some of the information around the square um, the idea is to make water much more present and a feature that we can really see moving through the square um, the, the idea is to create almost temporary kind of water courses that run through the shaded garden and there's also going to be an area of wetland which is pretty much complete um, which pretty much always be wet and that will be really valuable to um, a whole plethora of different species i'm not sure if we'll put fish in but fish they turn up um they do <laughs> it's incredible how they arrive at a place um the there he goes that um birds that forage in water will be in a pond and potentially end up with vegetation on their feet that has eggs from fish then they'll fly on to the next place and that's how they move <laughs> um so it's potentially you would probably get frogs yeah yeah um and what we were hoping to encourage is some um, dragonflies and damselflies like this one this is the ruddy data they call it um, this has been evolved, this has evolved to actually lay its eggs on um, vegetation that's dry, but those ha eggs will only hatch when they become inundated with water. So they really like sort of ephemeral and ephemeral water bodies that aren't always wet but will s seasonally be. Um, we'll also potentially encourage one of my favourite birds which is the, if I can find it, this one. This is the grey wagtail. And it's becoming quite common now in London along the canals and the rivers. They really like moving watercourses. So there's potential there for, for these to even show up. Can you that bird's going to be down? No, so there's going to be the, um, there's going to be the um, secluded water garden um, as well as an area of wetland at the surface but actually with the right sort of planting beneath the ground she might actually encourage bats and birds to go beneath into that secluded water garden but they wouldn't get trapped I think it's always going to be left as an open feature that things can move in and out of yeah so it might actually this is a grey wagtail and they're called wagtail because they do just wag their tails like this. <laughs> yeah. um, and then uh, goldfinch, um, they're a fairly common species, but they are a target species, the Wild West End. So um, 
finches have evolved a beak shape that is um, specifically for eating seeds. So plants um, that create seed heads, some behind you, will be left to sort of die naturally with the seed heads still on them, yeah. like this. Um, and then species like the goldfinch can, can feed on those throughout the winter. Um, we, uh, <laughs> they're really, uh, leaving dead stems from vegetation are really valuable for invertebrates as well. So it gives them a little sort of crevice to go and shelter in over the winter. Um, yeah, mostly, in general, the more tidy and neat um, a planting is, the less, the less valuable and attractive it is for wildlife, and the more kind of wild you can allow it to become, the more life will arrive. Um, so we want to hit a good balance in the planting um, so that we encourage all this wildlife, but also it still looks attractive. Um, and that was one of the final questions that we had for you, actually, was how you felt about there being more naturalistic and wild kind of landscape types in the square. Yeah, wood from fallen trees would be fantastic and you can do so much with them. Um, what would be brilliant is um, to maybe create even sculptures and things from that, from that, and that's recycling that, that wood. Um, so you could create things like um, you can create things like totem poles. Actually, you know, with um, with dead wood, um, you can drill holes in that are specific like width, and um, solitary bees love that. Um, if you bury the wood into the ground slightly, then that feature could also be used by by beetles like stag beetle. Um, so they they go and they can lay their eggs between the soil and the 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 wood beneath the ground. Stag beetle, the stag beetle. They're they're quite amazing creatures. I don't know if you if you've never seen them. Um, they are like found in London um, and a lot in the parks. They can be this big. Um, they and I, the males have a sort of stag like headpiece. So they're quite cool. Yeah, they, there's lots of species of stag beetle uh, all across the world. So you probably do find them in Africa as well. You get those rhinoceros be beetles as well. Yeah, two horns, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we could even have beasts like that here. <laughs> um, yeah. I think the last, the last thing I wanted to maybe bring up was how it's going to be really important for us to encourage... Um, people to feel like it's a kind of playful space and where you can feel like you're really sort of immersed in nature. So the idea of having taller planting potentially could therefore make you feel a bit more childlike where the habitat is around you and you feel like you're sort of walking into it and exploring. Um, and obviously we want to make it really fun and a playful space for our children as well. Um, by getting children sort of a bit closer to nature and having that access, perhaps then they might feel like they're more involved and have a kind of custodian role over the environment. We hope you enjoyed this snippet of the Tuesday talk on ecology and wildlife. For more information and to view the exhibition content online, please go to grosvenorsquare.org. Thank you.